Today's sermon is entitled, The Promised Holy Spirit. Please turn with me to Ephesians 1. We're going to look at verses 13 and 14. Um, while we were looking at Ephesians 1, 11 and 12 last week, we noticed the Apostle Paul praising God that God in His mercy had made these Jewish Christians of whom Paul was a part His, his own people. God's people belong to Him and God has done this by His own will. He's done this for His own glory. And so Paul glories in that truth. And in these verses we're going to be studying today, he applies the same truth to Gentile Christians in the congregation at Ephesus. So if you look at the first few words of verse 11, we read, In Him also we have obtained an inheritance. Notice he uses the pronoun we. And then if you look at the beginning of verse 13, In Him you also, when you heard the word of truth. Why does Paul change from we in verse 11, which we looked at last week, to you in verse 13, which we're looking at today. Because in verse 11, he's speaking specifically about how God in His mercy has re reached out first to the Jews as the Old Testament people of God, awaiting fulfillment of the new covenant in the Messiah. He, he's called those who are of the nation of Israel, basically the visible church in the Old Testament, to saving faith in Jesus Christ. God fulfilled His covenant in sending Messiah. There's one covenant of grace, and since God has completed that covenant in Christ, well, you're either in the covenant or you're out of the covenant. And God regenerated a group of these Jews from the Old Testament church, a large group. But, and He opened their eyes to see Jesus as He is, that He is the Messiah. And He called them to saving faith in Jesus Christ. And so Paul says He's done this first. They were the first to hope in Christ. And Paul was among them. And Paul's reminding the Gentile Christians in Ephesus now, in his mercy and in his plan, that he saved this body of believers out of Israel, even while much of Israel rejected Jesus as Messiah, and they went on in unbelief, yet God saved to himself a people out of Israel. And then in verse 13, he turns his attention to the Gentile Christians there in Ephesus. And he says, he has done the same thing for you as well. One of the things that will come out of our study of this passage is Paul's emphasizing that there are no second-class Christians. Jewish Christians, Gentile Christians, all saved by the blood of Christ, by the plan of God, by His mercy and grace, all adopted into His family, all given the fullness of inheritance of His Son, all called a special chosen possession of the Father. And so Paul is calling on us to bask in this glorious truth of God's mercy to us. So let's prepare to hear God's Word read in Ephesians 13. But before we do that, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13. But before we do that, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our Lord and God, this is Your Word of truth. This is the gospel of our salvation. And so we pray that You will give us ears to hear that truth and hearts of faith to respond to it and believe and trust. We ask, O oh God, that You would, by Your Spirit, You would pierce our hearts and that, that we would be able to render back to you grateful praise and faithful obedience. And so we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So this is God's Word, beginning in verse 13. In Him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in Him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it, to the praise of His glory. And amen. May God write the eternal truth of His Word upon all of our hearts. Well, it goes without saying, we live in a very narcissistic culture, a culture that is preoccupied with itself. We live among selfish people, and we like to think that it is, it's all about me. We're affected by that. You know, you've, you've heard the joke of the young lady who went out for dinner the first time with a rather self-absorbed young man. And after he had entertained her for about 45 minutes, talking about this manuscript that he had submitted for publication. He said to her, but enough about my book. Now let's talk about me. Now she should have immediately said, you know that phone number that I gave you earlier? Uh, you might as well just go ahead and delete it. Because he had made it all about him and likely if this relationship continues with that young man, it's always going to be about him. Well, we live in a culture that's preoccupied with self. It's all about us. That's the way we like to think about life, and that's even the way we like to think about church. It's all about me. We want 
it to minister to us where we are. Uh, perhaps we want to focus uh, the ministry of the word to focus on primary concerns that we have in our lives. It's often hard for us to think about God's kingdom and his plan and his purposes, not only in our own lives, but even for our congregation. And that's why Paul's prayer here is so helpful because Paul makes it clear that it's not until we are decentralized, it's, it's not until we're taken out of the central focus of our lives and that God is, is placed in the proper place. He's on the throne. He's the center of everything. It's not until God is the center of everything that we ever find true delight and happiness and satisfaction and true wholeness. Now, isn't that interesting? It's one of the paradoxes of the Christian life. It's not until God is at the center and we seek Him and His glory and His kingdom that we experience true exaltation. Because until we become last, we are not in the position to be exalted with Christ. Until we are humbled, we cannot be raised. And it is when God is at the center of life that we are the best off. And our deepest, most real needs are most attended to. And we learn that lesson in this prayer. Here's Paul speaking to these Ephesian Christians who are experiencing persecution. They're marginalized in society. They, they face many doubts and uncertainties. <clears throat> they bring many anxieties with them when they come to their little uh, house church and to worship there in, in Ephesus. And yet Paul begins his letter by speaking about God, about who he is, about what he has done, and about what he has given to us. And the focus is on giving praise to God. We've said it over and over uh, in this prayer in verses 3 through 14. Paul's focus is doxology or adoration or praise to God. He's taking the eyes of the Ephesians, and really he's taking our eyes off as well, he's t and he's pointing to God. He's, he's focusing our attention on God. And he's saying, give praise to God with me. But the irony is, when we take our eyes off ourselves, off our circumstances, and off our needs, and our situations, and our desires, and when we get out of the mindset that, it, that it's all about me and what I want, it's precisely at that moment when we're focused on God that we find that God in His mercy, He takes care of us better than we could have ever imagined. Better than we could have asked for or thought. And that's what I want us to see in this great passage today. So there are three things here to consider this morning. First, in verse 13, once again, Paul emphasizes God in His mercy has made you His special possession. So Paul's praising God for this. And then in verse 14, you'll see again, Paul calls on you and me to give praise to God because God has given us His Holy Spirit. And then finally, at the end of verse 14, you'll see Paul again uh, calls us to praise God with all that we are and all that we have and all that we do because it's all for His glory. So let's begin in verse 13 and look at His words here. He's calling on us to give praise to God. In fact, He Himself is giving praise to God because, point one on your outline, God has made us His possession. So listen to the words here, verse 13. In Him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in Him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. So Paul is saying, Gentile Christians, you too have heard and believed the gospel. You were marked by and with the Spirit of God as God's own possession. Now that would be tremendously meaningful for both Jew and Gentile Christian alike. Because every good Jewish believer would know that in the Old Testament, Israel was called God's own possession, God's own people, His heritage, His inheritance, the thing in which God delights. And Paul's saying to these Gentile Christians in Ephesus, that you, having heard the gospel, you having believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, you are now declared in God's giving you the Spirit, you're now declared to be God's own possession. If I were to paraphrase verses 13 and 14, I would do something like this. Paul is saying that in Christ, having listened to the gospel and believed, God has assured you of His promise to you by giving you the promised Holy Spirit, who promises to you God's inheritance for you and in you with a view to God's inheritance in you and all to God's praise. Paul's saying we praise God because we realized that in His mercy He has made us His possession. I want us to notice three things in particular out of verse 13. Notice the hearing, the believing, and the assurance. He says to these Gentile Christians, you have heard the truth. 
Now, it is a blessing of God to be able to hear the truth. Not only to simply hear it proclaimed, but to be able to, to really hear it with understanding. Lord Jesus Himself, in the parable of the sower and of the soils, you remember, He makes it clear that not everyone who comes in contact with the Word of God really hears it and understands it and embraces it. In fact, most of the soils in that parable reject that Word. But Paul is saying to these Ephesian Christians, you heard the truth. When you heard the gospel proclaimed, you listened to it, and you understood that it was true. Let me stop and ask you today, when you gather for worship with the people of God, now if you're listening online, maybe in your local context there, you attend a church, and I, and I hope that you do. But if you're part of our congregation here at Faith Presbyterian on Sunday morning and or Sunday evening in, in corporate worship, or even in Sunday school, or you have a midweek Bible study. Do you hear the word of truth? Do you understand and believe the truth which is being proclaimed? How do you listen when you're gathered at church? Do you listen like a child who's so intensely looking at either a television show or playing a video game, that when his mom comes and tries to get his attention, she can't even hardly break through because he's so focused on that video game? Are you locked on like that when you are listening to or studying, interacting with God's Word? Have you thought about the fact that listening is a discipline? You know, listening is very active. I had to learn that discipline when I first attended seminary when I was 34 years old. I was, I was uh, usually mentally exhausted, you know, after a day of classes because... I had just spent my whole time trying to grasp and internalize everything I was hearing. You can develop a discipline of listening. So is that how you listen when the Word is being proclaimed? Do you hear with attentiveness the Word of truth, the only gospel of salvation? The Apostle Paul is saying of these Ephesian Christians that they heard the gospel, which must not only be proclaimed, it must not only be heard, but it must be believed if we are to be saved. The Apostle Paul is saying to these Ephesian Christians, when we preach the gospel, you believed it. You didn't say, well, that's nice and interesting, but uh, we're not going to do anything with that. You responded in belief. You trusted in Christ. You believed the message of salvation. And again, this is so vital for us to realize today because some people hear the gospel proclaimed and their response is, well, that's very nice, but it's not for me. Or other people are just indifferent to the gospel altogether. Some people are actually angered by the gospel. They're offended by the gospel. And some people say, well, that, that, that's true for you, but, but there's also something that's different and it's true for me because, you know, after all, all roads lead to God anyway. There are various responses to the gospel. But there's only one saving response to the gospel, and that is to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ as He is offered in that gospel as the only way of salvation, as the one who purchases for us the forgiveness of sins, the one who cleanses us and who gives us the blessings of being adopted into God's family and eternal life. And Paul's saying to these Ephesians, you believed. When we preached the gospel, you responded when you heard and you believed the truth. And then he says, you need to understand that God has sealed you with His Holy Spirit. He has marked you out as His own possession, and here, thereby He has assured you of receiving His inheritance, and He has assured you of His love for you. Isn't that beautiful? The Apostle Paul is saying to these Gentiles, God has placed His mark of ownership on you by giving you His Holy Spirit. Remember from the Old Testament times, as a way of assuring God's people, He often gave them signs or marks whereby they would know of His love for them. And they could be reminded and brought back to obedience in response to His blessing to them by living a life of repentance and faith, which produced in them the fruit of repentance. They lived their lives according to, to following God because that was the fruit of their repentance. So for instance, to the children of Israel, God gave the signs of circumcision and Passover and the Sabbath day. And to Christians, he's given the signs of baptism and the Lord's Supper. But isn't it beautiful here that Paul does not say that God has given us a thing or a right as a mark or a seal or a sign of his ownership. 
But He's given us a person, an awesome, divine, most powerful person, the third person of the Trinity. The mark of ownership that God has given to believers is the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit. His indwelling of us, His possession of us is a mark of His ownership. Salvation is by faith alone, and all those who trust in Jesus Christ alone are marked out as belonging to God, and we are assured by the Holy Spirit. And Paul is saying, Gentile Christians, you understand that God has done this in order to prove to you, uh, just like Israel, that you are His treasured possession. He has given you His Holy Spirit. Now that's very significant. I remember a friend who came to me one time from a different theological pers perspective, and he, he was saying, you know, it's wonderful to be a Christian, but I just, I just wish I could have been a Jewish believer because God's blessings are especially on the Jewish people, and, and, and I wish that I could have been a Jewish believer. Well, you see that the, what the Apostle Paul is saying to these Gentile Christians in Ephesus. God has heaped on you every spiritual blessing in Christ, and you are ever bit as much God's possession as Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Your background is utterly irrelevant. All God's promises belong to you as you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. God has heaped on you His promises to you. He has made you His special possession. He has sealed that possession. He has, assur has assured you of that promise by giving you not a thing but, a Holy, but the Holy Spirit Himself. You are indwelt by the Holy Spirit. Then point two on your outline. The Holy Spirit is God's seal of confirmation. Holy Spirit is a seal of God's promises to us and His ownership of us. He's, he's the deposit. He's a guarantee of our inheritance. This is a glorious truth, and Paul continues it in verse 13. So here's a second thing I want us to see. Paul says that having believed, you were sealed in Him, in Christ, with the promised Holy Spirit, who has, is given as a pledge of our inheritance, with a view to the redemption of God's own possession, to the praise of His glory. So Paul began this prayer by pointing us to God in praise because He's made us His possession in Christ. Now Paul praises God because He has given you His Spirit. And I want you to notice what, he's, what he's, he calls the Spirit here. He says the Spirit is the, the promised Holy Spirit or the Spirit of promise perhaps in some of your translations. He calls the Spirit a seal, a deposit, or a down payment. So let's look at these things here he says about the Spirit. Paul is saying that the Holy Spirit is the promised Holy Spirit. He is the confirmation of God's promises to us and of God's ownership of us. That He is the deposit, He's the guarantee of our future inheritance and God's inheritance of us. So first of all, he calls Him the Spirit of promise. Now that means a lot of things, but one thing it means is that this Holy Spirit being given to the Gentiles was prophesied by the prophets in the Old Testament. There are many examples of this, and I'll just show you one. If you'll turn with me to the book of Joel, Joel it's, it's right before the book of Amos, right after the book of Hosea. So it's Hosea, Joel, Amos. And if you turn there to Joel 2.28, you'll see Joel prophesying under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, saying, It shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my Spirit on all flesh. If you go down to verse 32, he continues to say, And it shall, be, it shall come to pass that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now, when was this fulfilled? Well, the Apostle Peter tells us it was fulfilled at Pentecost. If you turn to, to Acts chapter 2, you remember when the apostles were gathered there at Jerusalem at Pentecost, and the Holy Spirit came upon them and rested upon them as with tongues of fire, and, and the multitudes that had been gathered for Pentecost, well, they began to, to looking at the apostles and they, as they spoke, and they said, well, well these, these, men, these men appear to be drunk. And the apostle Peter stands up in Acts 2.14, and he says, Men of Judah and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give ear to my words. For these people are not drunk, as you suppose, since it is only the third hour of the day. It's only nine o'clock in the morning. How could they possibly be drunk? But this is what was spoken of through the prophet Joel, he says. And then he quotes that great passage from Joel. In other words, as the apostles and the disciples prophesied and spoke in tongues under the 
inspiration of Holy Spirit, Peter is saying that the promise of God, the prophecy of Joel is being fulfilled. The Holy Spirit is coming upon us. And a great multitude, we're told in Acts 2, came to faith in Christ. Verse 40, 41 there says, So those who received His word were baptized, and there were at, they were added that day about 3,000 souls. And they came from all over the place, as Luke told us back in verses 9 and 10. They came from all over the place. These people who had come to faith in Jesus Christ. But you'll remember, if you turn forward to Acts 10, that Peter had even more to learn about the fulfillment of Joel's prophecy. You remember Peter was called to go and preach to a, gospel, to a Gentile household, the, the, the gospel, and it was the household of Cornelius, and he did that. And he went there, and in Acts 10, 34, after preaching the gospel to them and seeing them respond, he says, I most certainly understand now that God is not one to show partiality, but in every nation the man who fears him and does what is right is welcome to him. And then if you turn over to the end of the chapter, Luke tells us in verse 44 that when Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell upon all those who were listening to his message. So when Peter had reported this to the church in Jerusalem, we read in chapter 11, verse 18, When they heard this, they quieted down and they glorified God, saying, Well, then God has granted to the Gentiles the repentance that leads to life. In other words, when those Jewish Christians heard that the Holy Spirit had manifested Himself upon the Gentiles, they knew that the Gentiles also had been brought into the family of God and had received the fulfillment of this promise which had been made through the prophets of old. They were included in God's family. They were included as God's own possession. So the Apostle Paul is saying, Gentile Christian, God has marked you out as His possession by the promised Holy Spirit so that you would know that God's promises to you are yes and amen in Christ Jesus. But he doesn't stop there. He also says, we were sealed in verse 13. We're sealed in Him with the Holy Spirit. That is, the Holy Spirit is God's mark of ownership. And that's a permanent mark, by the way. You know that a brand is often put on an animal to indicate who owns it. Very often stamps or seals are affixed to official documents to indicate our ownership of them. And again, Paul is saying that it is the Holy Spirit who has been given as the mark of God's ownership of us. And knowing that we are owned by God produces assurance. And so the very purpose of being sealed with the Holy Spirit is that we might be assured that God's promises to us will come to pass. And in connection with that, Paul says a third thing. Notice that the Holy Spirit in verse 14 is given as a pledge or a guarantee of our inheritance. The, pledge, the Spirit is a pledge or a deposit, a down payment, guaranteeing that we will receive God's inheritance and guaranteeing us that we are God's inheritance. Just as an engagement ring is a pledge of marriage or just as a deposit on a house is a partial payment in indicating that the fullness of that amount will be paid to the owner or to the bank eventually. So also the Spirit is given to us as a deposit, as a down payment by God indicating to us that He will give us the fullness of His blessing. The Holy Spirit applies the redemption accomplished in Christ to us. And it's a down payment assuring us that God will give us the fullness of His inheritance. Just as in Old Testament times, dowries would be given as a pledge indicating that a husband would, would take full care of a wife, so also God gives us a spirit as a down payment of His full blessings. So Paul's saying to us, you're God's possession. And by the Holy Spirit Himself, He has pledged to you that He will give you your full inheritance and that you will be His full inheritance in Jesus Christ. And dear friends, those things are absolutely life reorienting. To realize that we belong to God, we are God's special possession, well, that changes the way we approach life. And to realize that God has given us His inheritance changes the way that we look at the finest, the most Wonderful things that the world has to offer. You know, there are many wonderful things in this world that are good in and of themselves. But if we love these things more than we love God, and more than we love the primary blessing of God, then we become idolaters. You know, we ourselves have been given so many things, many good things, that often distract us from the first and the best thing. And realizing that God has guaranteed us the fullness of His inheritance 
causes us to, it just pales in comparison any of the other things that we think to be so great in our life experience. You know, you may be sitting here today and you may be thankful for many things. And, uh, Lord, you've, you've given me many friends, you may be thinking. You've given me a wonderful family. You may be delighting in that. The fact that you have a, a wonderful family and they're so close to you and you can, you can be with them a lot. And there are many families whose families are spread out all over the country and so they don't get to see them very much. Or you may be delighting in the fact that God has given you a, a good job and or you delight in the fact that your, your children are going to, to college, to a certain school they wanted to attend. But if we value those things, all those good things, any of those good things, if we value that more highly than the inheritance that God has pledged to us in the Holy Spirit, then we've missed the, the first things, the best things, the most important things. And the Apostle calls on us with the Ephesians to give praise to God because of the gift of the Holy Spirit. And finally, last point in our outline says in verse 14 that we've been given the Holy Spirit as a mark of God's possession of us. Why? To the praise of His glory. It's all to the praise of His glory. So that's point three. All to the praise of God's glory. And Paul call, is calling us again to praise God with all that we have and with all that we are and with all that we do because we've been chosen as God's unique instrument in Jesus Christ. We've been called to live for His glory. And so the whole of life is to bear the marks of our realization God has chosen us for Himself, that He has endowed us with an inheritance beyond our comprehension, and that that is a life that is, is reoriented, our lives are reoriented by that truth. Once again, we see how in giving praise to God for who He is and what He's done, in displacing ourselves from the center of our concern, we suddenly realize that in giving back praise to God, that He has provided for us richly beyond what we could ever think or ask. Father, thank You today for Your Word. We ask by Your Spirit You would cause us to love the best things, that we would love and seek after You and Your kingdom and Your inheritance rather than following after any of the other things that are so much in our lives. Lord, we ask that You would do this, You would change us, cause us to grow by Your Spirit who assures us of all your promises. We ask that in Jesus' name. Amen.